There is no question that when we look at 2021, starting in 2000 and 2022, it's been a very tough, tough few years. But as we wrap up this year, we wrapped it up by being thankful, by thanking God that we could see your hand and that it is traceable, that it is verifiable that you are our God and you've watched over us. We're going into a period that often in, on the Christian calendar is called the period of Advent. And that is the period waiting for the celebration of Jesus Christ over Christmas. Traditionally, many people have traditions that are truly wonderful. One of them that I've been blessed to be a part of is four weeks prior to Christmas. The family gets together. Christmas carols are played. Yes, you've guessed it, Boney M. And some other ones from uh, German descent. But very nice Christmas carols, and we would sit and have coffee together with cake and in my case, banting cake. Um, and then we'll sit down and talk, and, but we'll spend quality time together. And the idea behind the tradition, which I think is quite good, is that even though we know that Jesus was not born on the 25th of December, there is a point of reference when all of Christendom would recognize the coming of Christ. The Christmas story, as we know it in the Bible, announces it with an angelic uh, 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 visitation to the shepherds. In fact, we were at the shepherd's field where this, was, this event would have played itself off or suspected to. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people in, sec, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. And the idea here is, is that the news of the coming of Christ would bring tremendous joy to everybody else in the world. If anybody else will be filled with joy at this time, it would be us. We know that God is real, that God is faithful, and as Ian so aptly demonstrated in him and Janelle and the children's lives, is that God is alive and that he's a God that provides and undergirds our dreams and heart's desires to honor him with our lives. Philippians 4 verse 4 is what Paul would write and say, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I looked at a poll today, uh, well, yesterday, the National Opinion Research Center found that people in the United States are more unhappy today than they have been in the last 50 years. According to the study, only 14% of American adults say that they are happy, which is down from 31% just two years ago. I would imagine that in South Africa or in Africa or in other parts of the country, it is probably worse. But what we do understand is that so often people's happiness and joy, or rather their happiness, is determinant on circumstances that surround their lives. When things are good, they are happy. They're feeling great. But when things are not good, they are unhappy. We start to think of times in our lives that we need to change. We hope for times when we could pay fewer bills, have a better job, the perfect spouse, children that always behave, that we can enjoy great health. And we're also surrounded by great people that are loving and kind and that we never have a problem with. But you see, life does not work that way. The Bible says from Paul's side where he lives and he can speak with authority and he says, well, you know, my attitude is to rejoice in the Lord always. Always means that there's no time limit to it or circumstantial limit to it, but every single time and waking moment in your and my life, we are always, always rejoicing in the Lord. When the money in the bank runs out three days before we are able to pay anything or buy anything to fulfill the family's needs, we still rejoice. We still rejoice in the Lord when, we, when things are good and we've got no problems. But you see, Paul says, I've got something to say to you today. I want to talk to you today about this joy. And so what Paul says, he's joyful at all times, even though he lived in very, very tough events. You see, Paul also lived in joy, even though he faced an uncertain future. This morning, we're going to look at Paul's letter. 
And we'll try to just chart a very brief journey through the book of Philippians. And hopefully we will walk away just thinking differently about our lives during this time in anticipation of that great joy uh, of arrival of Jesus Christ to Christendom. Paul mentions a lot of negative things in chapter 1. He speaks of himself being in chains, and he speaks of himself being in adverse conditions. But for now, I want us to uh, listen to the video that we've got playing. Johannes, you need to look for us. I'd like you to watch a clip with me, please, if you would. Being in a good mood is really great. And most languages have lots of words to describe the experience, like happy, cheerful, joyful, and so on. The same goes for the languages of the Bible. In ancient biblical Hebrew, there's a variety of words, like simcha, sason, or gil. In the Greek New Testament, there's kara, euphersune, or agaliasis. Each word has its own unique nuance, but they all basically refer to the feeling of joy and happiness. Now, what makes these biblical joy words interesting is noticing the kinds of things that bring happiness and also seeing how joy is a key theme that runs through the whole story of the Bible. Let's start with sources of joy. On page one of the Bible, God says that this world is very good. And so naturally, people find joy in beautiful and good things of life, like growing flocks or an abundant harvest on the hills. The poet of Psalm 104 says a good bottle of wine is God's gift to bring joy to people's hearts. People find joy at a wedding or in their children. There's even a Hebrew proverb that compares the joy that perfume brings to your nose with the joy a good friend brings to your heart. However, human history isn't just a joy fest. The biblical story shows how we live in a world that's been corrupted by our own selfishness. It's marked by death and loss. And this is where biblical faith offers a unique perspective on joy. It's an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. So when the Israelites were suffering from slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them into freedom. And the first thing the Israelites did was sing for joy. Even though they were in the middle of a desert, they were vulnerable, the promised land was still far away, they rejoiced anyway. Later biblical poets looked back on this story and they remembered how the Lord caused his people to leave with joy, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. This joy in the wilderness, this was a defining moment, a way of saying that the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. This theme appears later in Israel's story, when Israel suffered under the oppression of foreign empires. The prophet Isaiah looked for a day when God would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. That's when those redeemed by the Lord will return to Zion with glad shouts, with eternal joy crowning their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them. And while the Israelites waited, they chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. This is why it's significant that when Jesus of Nazareth was born, it was announced as good news that brings great joy. We're told that Jesus himself rejoiced and gave thanks to God his Father when he began to announce the kingdom of God. He even taught his followers the same joy in the wilderness, saying, when people reject you or persecute you for following me, rejoice, be very glad, because your reward is great in heaven. After his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news that he was the risen king of the world. And as they did so, the early Christian communities were known for being full of joy, even when they were persecuted. Like when the Apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy even if he gets executed. He called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. He believed it was the gift of God's spirit, a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that you ignore or suppress your sorrow. That's not healthy or necessary. Paul often expressed his grief about missing loved ones or losing friends or his own freedom. He called it being full of sorrow and yet rejoicing. As he acknowledged his pain, he also made a choice to trust Jesus that his loss wouldn't be the final word. This is very different from the trite advice to turn that frown upside down. Christian joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and love. And that's what biblical joy is all about. Thank you so much, Harrison. What we find in joy, it's very different to what you can find 
in this world. Paul had joy despite his unpleasant circumstances. We know that Paul was imprisoned in Rome, and even though people would have considered it a very negative circumstance, Paul saw this as a massive opportunity for Christ. Paul also saw this moment that even though it was tough, there was going to be a dismantling of that powerful state from the inside, from its rot outward. As Paul went to Rome, we know that he wanted to go to Rome as a preacher, but he ended up going there as a prisoner. You see, the idea of how God often makes things happen is very different to how we believe it should happen. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has be become known throughout the whole imperial God and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You see, there's a very great difference going in when you're a criminal. And Paul wanted to be clearly understood that the person that placed him there was not them, but Christ. You will watch this attitude of people who live a godly life. That despite the things that they face, despite the way that they are treated, they will always see it as God's hand. It's amazing that as I was studying again this morning, it came to my mind that even in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ was led into the desert by God's Spirit. If we watch as uh, in, in the story of Joseph, Joseph was led there by God. It was incidental how it would occur. You see, it would have been easy if Paul was living the easy life and he would have sat down and said, but why me? I can't believe that these bad things are happening to me. I wanted to preach the, the gospel in Rome and here I'm stuck in prison. Lord, how could this have happened? You see, maybe Paul had the idea that he'll be standing in one of these great auditoriums, in these great arenas, speaking to thousands and thousands of people that are going to listen with bated breath, where he could well articulate God's word to them, but God chose a route that's very different. In the same way with Jesus Christ, one often wonders how he would come. You would think, surely you could have done something a little bit more flashy than having him go into a pig pen or a, a, a pen with animals. Surely there was another way. But no, you see, God decides to deal with things very differently compared to the way we deal with things. You see, Paul learned that the imprisonment of him in Rome was not that they were going to shut the door on the gospel, that they were going to open up new doors inside of that darkness, because he believed that God was everywhere, that God was even in the darkness, even in the dungeons where it stank, where there were no prisoners' rights, but you, he knew that God was there to give access to people that were in prison. P let me just say this to you very quickly, Brendan. The, the best person to speak to about the gospel is a prisoner. Because that person knows that that's where he is. He's there because he deserves to be there. Strangely enough, when you speak to someone who is in very opulent or very favorable environment, they will not consider themselves as being lost. They will consider themselves, what are you talking about? I'm not lost. Look how great my life is. You know what I mean? I'm cool. I'm fine. What, are you nuts? I'm not lost. But I want you to see the oddness about his imprisonment. You see, when they put him in prison... In chains. They changed him to a guard. And so for eight hours, he had that guard exclusively to himself. Where he could speak to him about Jesus. And even though the shift would change, he would say, bring me the next one. Let's sit down and talk. You see, Paul understood some things far greater than that. While he was in prison, he would talk to people about Jesus. The prisoners with receptive hearts, their whole situation was helpless. And he would talk to them about the hope 
that lies beyond this dungeon. But he would also be writing to the Christians outside. And I would imagine many prisoners in the area would be listening to him as he dictated those letters through an amanuensis. He would tell, write to this church, write to that church. Say this to them. And so they would have been accessible to all that wonderful information. But I want you to watch that when he was in prison, he never sat and he was never bogged down with his own physical circumstances. He was more interested in the spiritual welfare of people that were outside. I want you to imagine that for two years he was in prison. But when they thought he was their prisoner, they were really his prisoner. He had a captive audience. For two years, this went on. And eventually he led Christians or even the, 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 the soldiers to Christ. He would teach them the gospel, people that he would never ever have been able to reach. And so Paul said his imprisonment actually served for the advancement of the gospel. And instead of feeling frustrated, he was excited. And so often you and I become so down on ourselves, rather than seeing an excitement of seeing how God's going to work in these circumstances. You see, brethren, rather than sitting down and being negative and saying, why did this happen to me? Stop that nonsense and thinking positive. How can I use this event that God had placed me in unique circumstances to be able to reach someone for Christ? What can I do to change their lives? Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, and we spoke about this in the lesson on the life of Joseph, that Joseph sincerely felt and he knew, and he never ever said, what you did to me was okay, but he said to them, what you did to me was evil. But God meant it for good. And revisioning the kind of trials that we are going through is critically important. Rather than becoming down in the gums and trying to justify your way through being depressed and feeling down in yourself, seeing no options because you're only thinking physically, God wants us to think things through differently. What attitude should you and I have? Well, the first thing I think we should have is ask and say, Lord, thank you that this has happened to me. Father, give me the wisdom to open up my eyes so that I can see the possibilities rather than the negativities. Milan and myself baptized a man in prison that's been in prison for 27 years. And as we baptized him into Christ, he jumped out. And I've never seen this before in my life. He jumped into the swimming pool and he kept swimming on and on and on. I looked at this and I looked at the guard and I looked at, there were two or three guards with us that morning. Milan and I just looked at each other. And he got out and he says, you have no idea how this feels. He went back to his cell that day in the, in the uh, 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 maximum security prison. And we went to visit him at a future time. And he made this comment, which I've read, read only in another book. He said, now I see the stars rather than the bars. He says, now I see hope rather than seeing hopelessness. He got out of prison on a parole. I visited him in the prison here in Goodwood. He was set free. After spending 27 years in prison, in and out, career criminal, he came out. He's married now, and with his wife, French lady, they manage a game farm in Mpumalanga. You see, brethren, life happens very differently despite circumstances. And I believe from Milan that he spoke to so many people about Jesus constantly. The second thing Paul had joy despite difficult people. So often, brethren, when we're surrounded by difficult people, we become real down in the gums. Why? Because we want everybody just to like us. But you know what the truth be told? It's not possible. People have different tastes. They come from different ethnic environments. They were socialized very differently. Their character is built differently. Their personality has developed differently. And so they are just different to you. But Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 14 to 17, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed Christ, spirit, preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I put you for the defense of the gospel. 
The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Firstly, I want you to understand that there are two very difficult effects that Christians can have on others around him. First of all, Paul said that most of the brethren were encouraged by his chains. They saw, Paul, they saw that Paul would continue to preach the gospel while he was imprisoned. They admired his boldness and his ability to rise above the difficult circumstances that you were in. And they were emboldened to proclaim the, the cross of Christ. And these were people who loved Paul. They saw him not confined to his house, but they increased their efforts to spread the gospel and would have facilitated that in any way possible. But there were some that didn't share his enthusiasm and admiration for Paul. Now, it's hard to think that some people would do that. But if you know how enticing it is to try to, to have a following, and this is what Paul was talking about. These were Christian preachers around that liked a following. And so they would look at Paul and say, good shot, this is a good time to get in on the action while Paul is neutralized so that we can get people to follow us. You see, Paul worked very hard to preach Christ to everybody. I want you to know that these were not heretics and false teachers. These were teachers that were not preaching false doctrine. Because if that was true, knowing Paul and his stance on the word of God would have said so. But in this event, they were preaching Christ. They were preaching the truth, but their motives were wrong. And so we often use this passage to say, yeah, but you know, but at least they're preaching. It's not true. Because if that was true and they convoluted the gospel of Christ, the very mechanism that would get them into a relationship with Christ, Paul would have condemned it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Verse 18, Paul's response to the critics is, what then shall I say? In other words, I see this happening. I've been told what's going on outside. What must I do? And then he says the following. Only that in every way, whether pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. You see, Brendan, at the end of the day, Paul was not a man that competed with everybody. If I can be quite honest with you, he also never felt the need to be credited or given any kind of prestige. I'm going to share just a short story with Laurie and I. We work on a project with his wife, and we've got a wonderful friend by the name of Tian Stoffberg. I don't know if you know the man at all or heard of him. He was the previous rugby captain of South Africa, probably one of the best that we've had, and a wonderful, wonderful man, very gentle soul. And if you would look at that man, he's one of the most influential people that we know. But you know what? He's one of those kind of people that is so humble. He is so humble and it's so beautiful to work with this individual. And he talks about he will walk up ahead and then we'll bring the impact player. For him, it's not about who gets the credit or the glory. It's about God and about living a life where he says we are a team and we want to do good and we want to change this world for the good. You see, if only we can live in that frame of mind where we will say, you know what, it's about God, it's about everything, it's about Him. He gets all the glory. There was only one thing for Paul, and that was that the gospel is preached. In the third place, Paul had joy despite an uncertain future. The reality of the matter is he was facing a trial, and more than likely he was going to be killed. These people didn't play with you. You didn't have, you couldn't turn around and walk out of a hearing just because you felt like it, like some of our politicians do. You walk out of a hearing, they take you outside, they finish you off and they say, right, let's cut legal costs here. No. You go sit on trial, they sort you out and you go to jail or you get executed. You see, Paul knew about that. He was facing a trial. But he knew that either when he lived or died, depending on the result of the trial, listen to verse 19 and 20. He says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed and that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Maybe today you are facing a very difficult circumstance and you don't know how things are going to work itself out for the rest of this year or even for the rest of the day or the week. He says all you need to focus on is to glorify God. 
that the moment that you're in, that this would walk out for the benefit of God and for his kingdom. Paul says, my concern is when I stand before a pagan judge in a pagan court, I don't want to do or say anything that will embarrass Jesus Christ. He says, I'm, I don't care about the, the verdict in my trial. My only concern, I would paraphrase, is that I have enough courage to stand up in their midst and by what I say and do, that I would exalt Christ Jesus. And that is why Philippians 1.21 is so powerful. He says, for me to live and to die is gain. A very simple way of looking at life. And many times when you're dealing with people going through trials, when you are a child of God, either way the ball swings, it's going to be okay. God's there. God's there too. You see, if God could be with Paul in the dungeon, he can be with you in your home, where you can switch on a light. You see, we need to learn how to be content, no matter the circumstances. The reason why Paul was able to re rejoice in the midst of imprisonment and all his critics who were trying to put him down and an uncertainty of his future because he had a very simple thing to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, brethren, no matter which way this thing works, this year is a beautiful, beautiful, tough year. I've never seen people turn to God the way they have this year that I would have never seen any other time in its history. I might not have been around as long as you have been, but I can promise you I have seen people's attitudes change. People that never under circumstances would have inquired about God or about Jesus now wants to know him better. Someone has once said, life is what you are alive to. Let me ask you a question. What makes you come alive? What makes you just become all starry-eyed, bright-eyed, and bushy-tailed? What makes you, when people talk about your favorite subject, that you really become all thrilled? And you say, I've got something to say. You know, I know people that play golf or rugby, soccer or computers. If you really want to see them come alive, you talk about those things to them. And you watch how their world lights up. Because immediately they become very excited. I know Johan is exactly the same. He loves computers. But if you want to see an older person light up, talk about their grandchildren. Ask them to tell you about their grandbabies. If you really want to see them discouraged when their grandchild is not doing well. If you really want to make their heart happy, phone them and say, I'm thinking of you. I know it's going to be okay. You see, Brendan, when your whole life is Christ, you talk about him for hours. Get a grandfather or grandmother going and they'll talk about their grandchildren till the cows come home. What is so beautiful, brethren, is that they really, really love their children. Paul's whole life was Christ, and it made his eyes light up. It put darkness in his life when everything would have said, I quite understand, Paul, while you would be down in the gums. I'm going to tell you a closer story. Kevin Dodge was talking about a wonderful story I picked up. He says, there was an eight-year-old boy named Frank. Frank had a date with his father to go fishing on a Saturday morning. And they were going to fish the whole day. So Friday night, old Frank got up the, the afternoon and he got his fishing gear ready. He got his fishing tackle ready. He got his fishing box ready. He got the rods ready. He made sure all the eyes were in place. He oiled the reels. He made sure everything was just 100%. He spoke to his mom and said, Mom, I want to speak to you about something that we can have for lunch. We're not going to have breakfast at home, Mom, but we're going to have breakfast together out on the boat. We're going to have it, also going to have lunch, and then we will be home for supper. Well, you know what happened? That Saturday morning they woke up and it was raining cats and dogs. Eight-year-old Frank grumbled and griped all, all day. He kicked the furniture, he kicked the dog and the cat. Nothing was right. He walked around and says, Why? <coughs> does it have to happen today? Why does it have to re rain today? His father, in a very weak moment, said to his son, but my boy, the farmers need the rain as well. He said, yes, but they can get it on another day. 
That afternoon, the clouds broke open and the sun came out. And his dad said, well, we can't go fishing all day, but we can go fishing now. They got up, got the fishing reels in the truck and off they went. And they started fishing and they caught more fish than they ever would have caught before. They came home and they, they gave some to his mom. They gave some to the neighbors. And the mom made fish for supper that night and they were all sitting around the table. And his father looked at Frank and his face was just beaming from ear to ear. And his father said, uh, Frank, would you say the blessing for us? And Frank said, yes, absolutely I will. And this was his prayer. God, if I sounded a little grumpy earlier today, it was because I couldn't see far enough ahead. And I'm sorry. Thank you for how you've blessed us. Isn't that really the problem with us? That we just don't see far ahead enough. We become short-sighted. But it's this kind of joy that just gives us that wonderful sighting in into the future. Because God's there as well. And so today I want to encourage you that as you navigate through the next couple of weeks, it might be tough at times, but take heart. God's there already. God has provided. He will take care of you. He will bless you. Let's stand and sing our song of encouragement as we close our service for this morning. Let's stand and sing.